Councilwoman Jan Perry, today is September the 27th, room 1010. This is the Energy and Environment Committee, and uh, we are going to uh, take some consent items if we have any consent items first, and then we'll get to the meat of this meeting. Good morning, Madam Chair. Rob here, with the CLA's office. We'd like to recommend for consent item number three, which relates to an agreement with Puentes McNally for legal services in the case of Miranda versus DWP. And also for consent item number five, which relates to a, a refund to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for overpayment of special event fees for $72,000. A second consent was five? Pardon? Was it five you said? The yeah, number five. <coughs> number five. Great, yeah. okay. And uh, that would leave you with three items. And if you'd like, uh, we could jump to number four, then two, and then leave I number one. The one on the consent. Who's here for the Academy Awards? Anybody? Nobody. Nobody's pulled out a card or anything. Right. No, that's right. The other thing I wanted to say, Ms. Perry, mm -hmm. I want to see if we could reserve some seats for LA Inc., mm -hmm. our visitors bureau, for promotion of the city. Mm -hmm. In the Academy Awards, we closed Hollywood Boulevard and they set up a grandstand. Mm -hmm. And let's say they had 20 seats that they could set aside so they could promote Los Angeles, let's say, in cities around the world. And if you win a prize to LA, you could sit in the grandstand. Uh, so I want to make that note to it to get the Academy's attention. The previous director is retired who had an inkling to support that. Sorry. But, uh, okay, thanks. Okay. Anyway. All right. So we'll, 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 we'll go forward to council, but I want to make that note that uh, requests, I'll get the paperwork to request. There's a friendly amendment to request cooperation for the Academy of Arts and Sciences on setting aside 20 seats for the uh, LA Visitors Bureau in the public grandstand for guest in Los Angeles promotion. Okay. Okay. We'll include that as well as a friendly email. Thank you. I'll give you the proper writing at the proper time. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. What, what, what is the next Number item? four, public works report relative to acceptance of grant funding from the from Cal Recycle for the okay. city's used tire recycling program. Okay. Is anybody here to report on that? Come on up here and make a... Oh. Good morning, uh, Council Member uh, Donald Bunch, Jan Perry. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Ron Milo from the Bureau of Sanitation. The uh, project in question concerns about the requesting authority to accept grant funding from uh, Cal Recycle uh, for the local government waste start cleanup and amnesty event programs. Uh, the Bureau of Sanitation has ongoing waste start recycling program that uh, cleanups uh, the city right of way and resident waste start drop off. This program prov uh, provides an env environmentally sound opportunity for all city residents to dispose their used tires. And uh, BOS uh, Solid Resources Support Services and the Solid Resources Collection Division jointly manage both programs. So uh, the BOS Waste Recycling Program is partially funded by an annual grant from the uh, Cal Recycle. Uh, local government waste start cleanup and amnesty event programs that allow CT to apply for grants for the close up cleanup, outreach, abatement, or other remedial related to disposal of waste start. So the city was awarded about 169000 in this grant. Does any of this grant cover salaries? Pardon me? Does any portion of this grant cover salaries? Yes, ma'am. What, por what portion of this money goes uh, to the For the waste start cleanup, we assigned one uh, refuse collection truck operator to go uh, the city alleys, and they uh, collect tires, and then they uh, they 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 uh, store it into city into the uh, district yards office. So they they are uh, uh, the the uh, car recycle funded the, the salaries. So then it. that person is a grant funded person. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other comments? No. Okay. So Mister, do we use any of the recycled tire for asphalt or is that yes good the we go to our asphalt plants we 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 have a contractor who recycled the tires and they they, they shredded it into small pieces and then uh, mostly uh, it's used to uh, an as uh, asphalt cement and they also use as a ground covering for uh, uh, truck and field truck and field but, but is, does it come back to our plants so, Rena Pereira with the Bureau of Sanitation. Um, currently, actually, most of the markets are 
uh, go uh, are exported to China. Got it. So um, the answer to that so question not, is not, not going to our plant. And how many plants do we have? Do we know alcohol plants, like two or three? I believe it's two so that Street two Services two. operates. All right. And the market takes it to China at this time. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Ms. Perry. You're welcome. All right. So uh, we don't have a quorum, so we'll uh, move this forward without recommendation. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. LeBlanc, for being here. Or you if you like, you can. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Would you like to recommend approve this communication from the chair? Yeah, sure. Is that Mm -hmm. And the only attending me uh, member supporting the chair. Note that. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Number two. Okay. All right. Let's see. DWP report relative to an agreement with the Basin Valve Company to provide safety and pressure relief valve services for a total amount of uh, not to exceed $1.5 million. Staff from DWP. John Dennis, Director of Power System Engineering, LADWP. Uh, this particular item is uh, uh, for purchase. It's a state requirement from the Department of Occupational Safety and Hazard. That's a requirement for our safety valves that we have on our system. And we're required to go through and do certified testing and repair of those safety valves throughout the rest through our uh, power system. And so this is a competitively awarded contract to a Basin Valve Company for a five-year duration. <laughs> um, I guess part of this agreement uh, allows the uh, generating, generating stations to stay in compliance with safety requirements. Could you just give me a synopsis of what the safety requirements consist of? Mr. Kokorian is here now, so we have a quorum. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Just tell me a synopsis of the safety requirements this contract allows us to fulfill uh, or to meet. <clears throat> Each of our uh, pressurized equipment, such as boilers um, or heat recovery steam generators that we have in our power plants, they mm -hmm. are equipped with safety valves um, that are pressure relief valves to prevent them from having a catastrophic failure. It's a requirement of the state code. It's a requirement of the um, codes to construct and design these. And so uh, these safety valves uh, are required to be tested. And uh, so this uh, by a certified tester. And any repairs that are done are also to be done by a certified, uh, state certified tester. And so this particular company in Basin um, meets that, the requirements of the state as well as the, um, for the inspection, for the repairs, and uh, to meet our requirements to continue to operate our generating stations. Okay. Any questions? No, I just wonder, how's our safety record? Uh, with DWP overall for power. Uh, with regards to this particular area, no, it's great. All overall, it's just I believe uh, if I could defer that to Mr. Benjamin, he'll be reporting okay. on the reliability. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, we'll uh, move that without uh, objection. And um, now that Mr. Krikorian is here, we can go back and do I believe it's three, four, and five. Yes. Uh, three was uh, recommended approved, uh, $75,000 uh, amendment to the agreement with Benjamin McNally. Approve as well, number four, the grant uh, request with uh, Cal Recycle. And approval for number five as well, the refund uh, to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, as well as a friendly amendment that they reserve seats for Alley Inc. to promote uh, the city of Los Angeles. Great. No objections? No objections. Okay, great. Um, we're going to go to one now. One. Now, let me just ask a question. Uh, well, I'll read the item, and then I just have a quick question. Sure. Uh, number one, motion, England or Perry, we're requesting the DWP to report as the status of its electric transmission system, its reliability and safeguards in place to mitigate potential blackouts. Who is Dr. Tom Williams? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. Okay, you have a new identity. Can we hear the presentation? All right, Doctor, are you doc, Dr. Clyde, Dr. Tom? You're Dr. Tom now? Okay. You, you can do it now or you can do it later. I, I, the only reason I offer you the time to do it now is if we run up against a time crunch, you know, I don't want to have to rush you. I'll do both. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, also Clyde Thomas. A.K.A. So, I'm a Tom. I'm not a Clyde. Fine. But anyway. 
Okay. Uh, El Sereno, uh, DWP liaison for the LA32 Neighborhood Council. Generally, you know my opinion regarding DWP. However, we're also dealing with changes of reliability. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Why? Because it costs money. Huge amount of money. We're talking about, hey, how about the distribution and delivery system? How about the transmission system? What we're talking about here is a transmission network that would rival almost any country in the world. We go everywhere. It costs money to go everywhere. Why not? Re I'm sorry, reliability? How much do are we willing to pay for having these on 24-7, 365, for not more than one second loss of service? How much would it cost? Because all of the reliability goes back as to deferred maintenance and other elements within the system. Without knowing what are we buying, what are we selling, how much is it going to cost? You know, it's nice to talk about, but it won't work until we come to grips with how much a system costs. This costs a lot of money. Are we willing to pay it? Are we willing to pay appropriate costs, rates, for having these on all but maybe one second out of every year? So that's a lot of money. How much money is it going to cost to have a reliability? Maybe it's efficient, maybe it's not. We don't know. But until we get the cost, even rough order of magnitude, are we talking about hundreds of billions of dollars? I don't know. So I would highly recommend having a cost element for anything, especially of this magnitude, rough order magnitude, plus or minus $100 million, life of project cost. So uh, what are we paying for? What do we get? And yeah, I, I've projected the rates might quadruple, not double, over the next 10 years because we're making major changes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Clyde Tom. Okay. Don? Jones? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Don Justin Jones, and I'm the managing director of a local firm called COPEC, C-O-P-E-C. We're one of the pioneer carbon dioxide greenhouse gas management firms. Our record goes back to 1991 in designing the first carbon offset projects for New England Energy System and the Edison Electric Institute. We've had over 50 utility companies become our clients and we're happy to say that in the past, the Department of Water and Power has been a client of ours as well. I'm here because I want to talk about a possible business opportunity. Recently, the Department awarded a contract for contracts worth billions of dollars in greenhouse gas offset management of the Department's own assets. In this morning's paper, we see that the AEG group, folks developing the stadium downtown, are offering to develop local carbon dioxide offset projects that would benefit the local jurisdiction. We pioneered some of those efforts. Some of those have taken place in Mr. LeBonge's district, some in Ms. Perry's district, having to do with using biotic means for offsetting carbon dioxide with support from polymers. Those are chemicals that, that increase the soil retention up to 400 times of water. What we'd like to do and what we've suggested the department's management is that we would like to partner with them in developing a suite of proposals that we could offer to the stadium group for offsetting these carbon dioxide emissions that are intended to be emitted through the use of concrete cement transportation, quantify them, have a baseline, make an offer to offset those in a job creation program that would use local youth. We partner with the LACC in planting some of these trees so far. We've got dedicated chemicals from the largest chemical company in the world, BASF, who've sent kilos of this uh, polymer material down here. It's uh, biodegradable, it's non-toxic, and we welcome the direction from the department to instruct the, the appropriate folks to work with us in making such a proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Nicole Burnson.
Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Nicole Brinson. I'm here on behalf of Councilmember Englander. He introduced this motion as chair of the Public Safety Committee. The blackout that happened on September 8th was the largest in California history. There were 5 million people in the dark overnight in triple-digit temperatures without air conditioning. Two nuclear reactors went offline. Sewage pumping systems went offline. Over 2 million gallons of raw sewage was dumped into the ocean, causing beach closures. There were cars that were left on the streets because fueling stations couldn't provide fuel, so they became virtual parking lots, but street light systems were out, and, you know, basically the entire city came to a halt, but also caused a lot of effects in other cities as well, including Los Angeles, when the train systems went out in San Diego. Additionally, in terms of public safety, you know, police stations had to use emergency generators just to take the emergency calls that were generated from the situation. There was a hospital that went offline for power for two hours because their backup generator failed. So, you know, the cause was determined immediately to be routine maintenance on the Yuma border, just simple human error. But when they went back and looked at the full situation, it was basically 23 separate incidents that happened on five power grids over a series of 11 minutes. So they also had said that there were safeguards in effect, that the utility had put them into effect so that this cascading effect wouldn't happen. So the council member thought that it was critical for DWP to come in and talk about their fail-safes so that we wouldn't have a similar issue here in Los Angeles, and also to talk about their emergency contingency plan in the case that their fail-safes went down, as was the case in the Yuma situation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can we have staff come up and begin the presentation? Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm committee members. I'm Aaron Benjamin. I'm the head of the power system at LADWP, and I'll try to address some of these issues and give you a background of what happened and what we have as far as the system similarities and differences of the situation that happened in San Diego. Just a couple of points that I'd like to make. The LADWP power system as an entity, it has its own balancing authority, which is a distinction that I want to make because what I'm going to tell you as far as the details has a lot of relevance as far as the reliability of our system. So in California, we have five distinct balancing authorities, and just kind of a parallel analogy is like having a control tower where air traffic controller controls any traffic coming into the area and out of the area is under the control of that traffic tower. So LADWP power system acts as its own control tower amongst the rest four of the other systems that are existing. And just to go through them, the biggest one being the California Independent System Operator, which is located in Folsom near Sacramento. IID, the Imperial Valley Irrigation District, is its own balancing authority. SMUD is its own balancing authority, and TID. So you have these large balancing authorities in California that we deal with as far as traffic coming in and out of our system. So fast forward to the incident that happened and just the trigger. Just to give you an update on the investigation that's going on right now, there's about 14 committees that are putting together just the forensics of what happened, you know, the time stamps, what caused the incident, and how to make sure the sequence of events are properly organized to figure out exactly what happened. We don't have much information of the work of the committee, but what happened on September 8th was that a station disturbance happened on the southwest of Arizona that triggered the incident. And just the general setup of a power system is that whenever a disturbance happens, there are safeguards in place to protect the transmission line and the generators and to make sure that the system operates as a balanced load. So whenever a large disturbance like this happens, this means that an incident triggered several cascading effects that translated into this large outage. 
And in the area of the, uh, the, uh, the, the area that San Diego belongs to, which is operated by the California Independent System Operator, the ties to that area was two, two points of entry. One was that station where the incident happened, and one is a, is a tie with the Southern California, California Edison system, which also had disturbance on our, on their end as far as the San Onofre nuclear power plant triggering a shutdown process to, that took out thousands of megawatts out of the pool. So this is in general what we know, and within 10 minutes of this incident that ha happened in North Gila Station in the southwest corner of Arizona triggered the cascading effect of that caused 5 million people to lose power and, and also go through the sequence of bringing the system back up, which included the, the bringing of the San Onofre nuclear power plant to supply power to the Caliso grid. The way, the way LADWP system is, is uh, structured, and as I explained, we, we have our own balancing authority. So if, if you can just imagine for a second what happened uh, at the control room that LADWP operates, our energy control room would, would have, we have staff 24-7 that are sitting on, on desks watching and, and observing the systems that are around us and, and making sure that our LEDWP system is protected. So if you can imagine for a second what happened in that control room is that we had our load dispatchers seeing this disturbance come through uh, the, the grid, the western grid, and making moves on our system to make sure that our system is protected, which includes ramping up our generation that we have in basin, and I'll touch a little bit about this, the reliability of those and importance of those in basin generation, which we made the point several times. This is a good uh, uh, example of how those generating units come into play whenever a disturbance like this happens. So our grid operators will put those units on, on call, and they will ramp up the generation on that in anticipation of separation of our system from the uh, the rest of the disturbance to make sure our system get, doesn't get dragged down with the disturbance and, and isolate our system to make sure that all the imports coming in and all the generation that we have are balanced with, this, with the city's load. So if you can imagine in that room, as, as the operators were seeing this disturbance within the 10 minute period that it took for this outage to kind of cascade through the systems, our operators were already making maneuvers to either uh, curtail imports, increase uh, in-basin generation to shut down transmission systems that are overloaded. And all these things were happening within those few minutes of critical uh, uh, reliability window that they had to make sure that our system is not dragged down. So as you can imagine, a lot of these utilities, including the IID territory, which was the, uh, the separate balancing authority, got overwhelmed with the with the magnitude of the uh, of the disturbance that happened, and that could have happened to us, uh, unless you know you, we we go through the uh, the systems that we have in place and and the operators that we have uh, on duty that know how to manage certain uh, the, these kind of disturbances and make sure they protect the city. So our transmission system, just to briefly to go over, uh, our design has evolved over over many, many decades of design and reliability being part, the heart of our system the design. We have a network uh, that comes, we have two maps here that I'd just like to point out. The city of LA is sitting over here. Uh, the disturbance happened in the southwest corner of, of Arizona and, and took out the southern uh, area of the, of, the, of the state. But the city of LA on its own, being its own balancing authority, having all these lines going all the way to Delta, Utah, uh, having connection to the Bonneville Power Authority, the nuclear power plant in Arizona that we bring power to, Hoover Dam, and, and the Navajo Generating Station, all these are exports coming into the city. And, and just bringing into the, that box the square that you see there, I want to point out the city of LA itself. So all these uh, uh, heavy lines that you see are represented these imports coming in from out of state. Coming into the city of LA, we have two entry points. We have the west side and the east side where these heavy transmission lines are coming into the city. We have, we have the capacity to dispatch those energy, uh, the power coming into the city 
throughout the entire city of L.A. And we have a loop system that takes, it's basically like a round, roundabout on a transportation side where you have traffic coming into the uh, city and then turning around and going on a loop around the city to make sure that any part that's taken out of our loop, we can back feed the system and, and keep the reliability. So there's, there's some differences in the design of our system versus what happened over there because one other important point to make is, is the LADWP is a vertically integrated system. So we have the generation, the transmission, and the distribution are all controlled by the energy control center that we have. So all the elements of the dispatch of power is controlled from one control center that, that has much more uh, coordination, uh, fast coordination and, and, and reliability components built into that rather than, for example, San Diego Gas and Electric is a distribution company. They have no control of the generation and they have no control of the transmission. So whatever happens in their system, it, they're basically trying to protect the ring around the city, but they have no control of the imports and they have no control of the generation coming in to the city. A couple of things on, on, the, on the design of our system. You know, we have, we, we have uh, the, part of our integrated resource plan and planning. Reliability, like I said, it's the heart of our design and our forward-looking, uh, you know, asset management that we put in place to make sure that we constantly look at our loads and constantly look at our risks and make sure we have enough redundancy in our system to take care of that. Uh, that possibility of, of these things happening. So you, we have several of these assets. We've talked about Castaic being in our system. Castaic is a, is a 1,200 megawatt of hydropower that we can bring online within 10 minutes. So if any, any system disturbance that we have that we need uh, fast-acting generators to come online, we do have that kind of capability to, to bring in. The repowering that we're doing right now at Haynes, we're putting six 100 megawatt fast acting units is is a 10 minute start from the order time to to getting getting those units online versus a old technology that that we're trying to replace the supercritical units that might take almost 3 years for it to come online so those units are not made to react to the disturbances like we saw today nuclear power uh, plants are not made for fast acting you know once the once the order is given to shut down, it, you have to go through the entire shutdown process. You cannot interrupt it, and you have to go through the entire inspection process and then put the, the units back online. So those are not made for fast-acting uh, response. We have a strong maintenance uh, and diagnostic system in place. We have the 10-year the transmission plan that we put in place in order for us to give more redundancy in some of these uh, lines coming in. and I'll, and I'll touch a little bit about the uh, the natural events that has happened, you know, starting uh, way back, you know, on earthquakes and fires and and the threats that we see coming into the city as we have, uh, you know, severing these lines for us is a huge risk. And I'll tell you a little bit about the mitigation that we have put in place. On the uh, budget side, we've talked about the maintenance of our system. We do, we do spend a lot of money on diagnos diagnostics technology to figure out the aging infrastructure we have, the points of failures, and spend money on, on the system, you know, with the cable replacement program that we have, with the pole replacement, the cross arms, and the, and the technology that we put in place. This has been our budget since the PRP started. We've, we've beefed up and, and, and uh, increased expenditure on our system, except for this year that we've taken a step back, you know, to, to kind of curtail a little bit about the, the program. And hopefully we can pick up the expenditure on, on replacement, replacement of these assets so we can increase the reliability of our distribution system. And this includes the, uh, the, the uh, reinforcement of our transmission line, uh, you know, reliability uh, programs that we have in our generating units, and also a lot of this expenditure is happening within the distribution system to make sure that the residents that, that get the power see that reliability. And the numbers show that those numbers are improving over the years. They've, the, the, the duration and the frequency of those outages have, have improved tremendously. 
Uh, reliability uh, being the center of our design, uh, as you can see, the, the, uh, the, the, diverse, the, the diverse sources of energy coming into the city is a critical element because if anything happens to those sources, we have ways of dispatching power around it. Having the uh, generators in our basin and, and making sure they're in very good working conditions and, and when we call on them, that they're available to come online and support the city is extremely important. And the sequencing of these, um, you know, the once through cooling being one of the, uh, the elements, the regulations that we have to deal with, the sequencing of the, the way we take these units out and replace them and, and, uh, and, and bring the new technology in is extremely critical because we don't want to have any vulnerable windows where we've taken a lot of these assets that we rely on out of service and put the city in danger of having any kind of disturbance like we've seen in, in the San Diego area. This is some of the, uh, the, the fires and, and uh, disasters that we deal with on, on, a, on a seasonal basis. This, is, this summer was not any different than any other summer. We've seen a lot of the fires in the hillsides that, take, that threaten our transmission line. We, we work around it, we, we take lines out, we dispatch power differently, we, we have redundancy to take care of it, but this always is a threat for our imports coming into the city that we have to work around. And, and our planning that happens on a daily basis takes into account any of these scenarios that could happen, that the same thing as that happened in San Diego, that, that we could, we could uh, you know, divert power to make sure that the system is reliable. So. I'll stop at that and then if, uh, answer any questions you have. Great. And uh, just let the record reflect that Mr. Alarcon has also joined us. Um, this is something that I've always tried to get but have not been able to get as, um, so that we can communicate better to the public about where we stand on the status of our power infrastructure. Um, you know, we all recognize that it's aging. I believe the council provided the department with some additional funding to support its power reliability program. And what, I, what I'd like to see, and maybe you can help me design that, and we, ha we can have a report maybe twice a year on what's been replaced, what's been upgraded, and that should include power poles, power lines, transformers. And um, I don't know if it makes sense for it to be um, assessed geographically so that people can see that is happening in a particular area, but I want you to help me develop a framework for that kind of a report so that we can communicate to the public the progress that has been made um, given that we have provided additional funding for it. Basically, it's to show people where the money is being spent and how quickly it is being put online or being implemented in terms of upgrades. Yes, we, we, we have those, those reports and we could provide um, we, we do uh, submit, uh, you know, monthly reports on, on the numbers and, and what we've done, but definitely we can work together. Does it have the location or the geographical Lo area? It is located, uh, you know, geographically located and also uh, based on the priority of the circuits, you know, taking the, the most vulnerable circuits and, and organizing in that priority. But definitely we can work on the presentation of okay, those numbers. I think that's part of what I'd like to initiate in this, in this committee as a protocol on a regular basis. And I'll talk to the CLA, I don't know if twice a year is enough, but I think we need to look a little closer at those reports so that we can demonstrate that we are making progress on the restoration and renovation of the uh, uh, power infrastructure to make it more reliable and that, uh, you know, okay. money is being spent as it should be. We could. And, and, and also to disclose to the public the logic that goes behind how you choose where to do the work. And it's somewhat based on age. Age, uh, oldest comes first. It's not always, it, it's a criticality. We, we, we have the criteria, we'll, okay. we'll be happy to put that also. We, we, we don't just go with one element of the uh, okay. replace. So there's a, there's a, there's a formula that, that we use, yeah. Criticality, uh, you know, age is of course a factor of the, uh, the, uh, the sustainability of the assets yeah. and also the, the risk of having that circuit out, for example, might be much more vulnerable for critical uh, loads that we have. So we have some some uh, priorities that we could share. All right, well, why don't I ha ask the CLA to work with me to prepare a draft of a motion, and we'll make that a whole separate item, and then that'll begin our process to make sure that we establish a protocol in this committee with 
um, factors that we um, measure uh, our progress uh, on a regular basis so that people are very clear where we're making progress and how we're making progress. We will. Okay. Oh. All right. Hi. How are you? Great. A plum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So, does anybody, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Benjamin. Very good report. Uh, just from historically, when we had the earthquake in '94, how fast was power back on? And was the whole city knocked out for the '94 quake? Uh, I have with me Ken Silver, who's the uh, the head of our energy control center and and the head uh, person on the dispatch. I'll have him go through the sequence of how the city came back online since the earthquake. So he's right. very familiar because he was in the control room. You know, uh, actually, uh, after the 94 earthquake, we had 97 percent of our uh, low of our customers back on within 24 hours, and that was in in cons in consideration of all the damage in the city. It was it it was a completely different scenario than in San Diego, where there was not really any damage. There was an intact system. Uh, we were dealing with a lot of uh, damaged equipment. Uh, but we were able to util utilize our in-city assets and that part of our transmission system that survived, and uh, we were able to rebuild the system, say, in 24 hours. Good, thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I've asked the City Council a number of times, because I think our budget is due April 20th every year, mm -hmm. and six months earlier is October 20th, and i got to talk to the CAO uh, today again. I think October 20th of that week, we should have an infrastructure Full bore, because all, it's all about infrastructure, and at some part of the day have water power come in. Uh, there's how many, how many power poles in the city like? We have about three, over 320,000 poles. Poles, 320,000 poles, and all the work. So I think it would be very good, and I think uh, if we could get that, members, Mr. Alicorn, Mr. Kokorin, ask that we set a day aside, just all the infrastructure, uh, because it, 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 the year moves quickly, and unless we focus on these, uh, sometimes we're not going to be as successful. Do you want to do it in committee or you want to do it in council? Well, I think we should do it both because power and water is so important. But I think from the council standpoint, I'll check with the CAO and the president of the council mm -hmm. and Mr. Parks because I was kind of mirroring the idea that he came up with a budget right, day. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. If you want to do a motion, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Um, is there a time when uh, the board of uh, commissioners considers that item? We we give them a, a month, uh, you know, uh, just a status yeah, report. I was just, I was just wondering if, if we could combine something, perhaps. Whatever. I'll, I'll have, look for it. What's most efficient? Staff make an extra presentation. We'll, we'll be happy to do well, either. I also think the one good thing about City Council that's on TV, what you just said there, that it was such an informative, concise presentation, somewhat brief, which but is all not, they need. It's not on TV. No, for the public to see it. Oh, so I think that's why in Council Chambers, oh. you know. So, okay, that's the thought. We'll right. be glad to do any anywhere you want to present this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Benjamin, for uh, for that report. I'd like to try to understand better uh, the point that you made at the outset that LADWP transmission lines were impacted by load reductions. How exactly does that happen when you have so, something outside of the balancing authority? Of this scale, I'll let uh, Ken uh, go through the sequence of how we balance that load because of the curtailment that happened outside our area and how we pick up the difference on our side. So I have a sense of how you do it. I'm, I'm wondering what, why it happened. What, what, when you have a massive outage outside of the balancing authority, right? How does that affect? How does the load reductions on transmission lines come about, and what, what's the impact of that? So, for example, Navajo is a point of generation for us that we, we get 477 megawatts of power from Navajo Generating Station. We also have four other uh, partners in that plant, so one of them being the, the utility that get affected, the, S, the APS, that, that utility that the event started with, their system is 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 being uh, basically the curtailment is happening in their system, so the, the whole unit, the, the Navajo generating unit gets uh, gets curtailed. So which your curtails are reduced, right. and you have to uh, balance we, that with right. in basin generation or right. some other source of generation. So we have emergency operating procedures where where we curtail our our imports to make headroom for other utilities to kind of maneuver around their systems. 
And as we curtail the imports, we have to balance them with our in, uh, internal generation to make up the difference. So our transmission gets curtailed because of the emergency operation procedure being triggered for other utilities. But if we're not ready for on our side, that curtailment would cause outages on our on our side if we're not ready for it. Right. So in this case, what was the magnitude in megawatts of what was lost in terms of importation because of this outside power outage? So we'll have uh, the, the Navajo line was curtailed from 477. Uh, well, the, the, um, well, we, well, what happened was when that first line was interrupted, it increases the flow coming into California on the remaining lines. So in cooperation, Mr. Benjamin indicated, in cooperation with the other utilities, power was, re was reduced uh, to offload those lines. We don't want to create an additional problem. So to offload those lines, um, we had, I, I believe it was about 400 megawatts that, that was initially curtailed of our imports, uh, both from our Palo Verde and of our, and our Navajo share in order, in order to offload those remaining lines. Um, and that was where the benefit of having our local area generation, we were able to quickly pick up that to balance our system. 400 megawatts. So in a typical day when you're at peak demand, uh, how much, uh, how much power, how much additional power can you generate within 10 minutes? When you're already at peak demand, how much more can you bring online? How much headroom do you have to make up for a loss? Depend, depending on the temperature and the situation, I like to try to stay in the summer. Peak. We might have close to six, seven hundred megawatts of of generation that we could, on order, we could bring online based on the, the contingencies and the spinning reserves and everything else that we have. Uh, some some days are much much tighter, like like on a hot day, uh, like. Actually, today is the day that we had the hottest day in LA last year. It was 113. At that time, the, at that time, the margin was about 100 megawatts or so. Right? Wow. That's about well, we would have all we have. Um, we have a variety of resources, and depends on how they're being utilized that day. For example, we have Castaic Power Plant, which is good for about 1,200 megawatts. It, whatever utilization we're using, if we're utilizing 400, that leaves 800 available for quick start. We have gas turbines, um, about 300 megawatts of quick start gas turbines that would are not normally utilized. They'd be available. And then with the variety of generating units that would be running, those that are not already at full load can be can be raised up. So it can be in the it, it could be in magnitude of 1,500 megawatts. More typically, it's probably more in the in the five or 600 megawatts, as Mr. Benjamin indicated. And then that's that's just the quick response. And then, of course, there'd be more capacity that you could bring on within a matter of hours. I, I assume that's correct. And that's with current infrastructure. Right. Correct. Okay. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to ask was uh, in in your lessons learned slide. There's a mention of the 2005 cascading outage in uh, in the LED DWP area. How did that compare with this most recent it's example, and how have we made changes since 2005 to prevent that kind of cascade, that specific kind of cascade? What were the circumstances of that, and what are different now? So just in general, the way, the way our system is designed as far as lessons learned, so we have very, very uh, um, a detailed investigation and a root cause analysis that goes on of anything that happens in our system. So this is an ongoing lessons learned because we're never going to get to a point where everything is protected to a point where we say we're not going to have either human error or design errors happen. But having said that, the, the process of identifying what happened, finding out the root causes and, and putting uh, uh, measures in place to take care of it is part of our daily routine that we go through. So 2005, when that instance happened, it was a human error uh, that happened w at the wrong place at the wrong time that caused that outage that, uh, that took a large part of the city out because of the 500 uh, uh, kV volt uh, transmission that was basically disconnected our system abruptly and that caused that disturbance that, that, that caused the outages. So we've done, we've, we brought a third party in, we've done the sequence of events just like it's happening now 
and we we highlighted some of these areas where which were were vulnerabilities that that we needed to fix one of them being the the process of making sure that contract drawings that come from outside and the inside design that we have our internal systems are the quality assurance is 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 in line with making sure that all the systems are compatible that is the lessons learned that we've done that the training was another portion that we've learned make sure that whenever we have um, a process in place that we have a, a second party coming in and checking checking the, the procedure for taking these positions out or making the repairs to make sure you have a fresh set of eyes looking at the procedure making sure there's no fatal flaws so we have about close to uh, 50 or so uh, recommendations that has come out of that event and also subsequent events that has happened that kind of added to our lessons learned uh, list Great. One final point, and I, you don't need to answer this if, because it's kind of out of the out of the blue. But by the time of council, maybe we can talk about it. In 2007 or 2008, there was a bill pending in the legislature uh, that was sponsored by IBW and opposed by the City of Los Angeles that required the top 10 municipal utilities in the state to do uh, regular public reporting of their reliability records and their records of, of power outages. I don't remember all the details of it, but I don't think that bill passed. But um, if you could talk when you come back to council about what your current state reporting regimen is about power outages we and con I think consistent with what the chair has asked for with our regular reporting requirement w what is the current reporting requirements that you have uh, in terms of reliability and how publicly accessible is that yeah. right now we are under the uh, the several of these agencies that we are members of so one of them I'm just, I'll start with the uh, the packing order the WEC system the western uh, the energy council that we are part of all the western states are part of the the council and then and then above that is the northern north california and i mean um, northern um, the NERC system which WEC is part of and then of course the highest level is the FERC which LADW is not jurisdictional but we do have certain guiding principles that kind of utilities abide by when it comes to reliability and reporting so we have standards reliability standards that all of us have to follow including LADWP when it comes to reliability loading orders violations we do do self report if we find something that we should be doing that we didn't do we do report that to the uh, to the WEC uh, and and cr uh, give, give them the corrective measures that we've taken and most of our reporting is self-report. We we check ourselves to make sure you know anything that we're doing, and if we cross the line on any of the standards, we do self-report to them. And and that's that becomes public after the settlement is done. That's that's something that all the utilities share. We learn from other utilities on what we're doing. It's a learning process that we're going through right now with all the requirements that uh, that we're put in place. Both WEC and us are learning how to deal with those uh, new standards, including the cybersecurity and, and all those other things. So, if I may suggest, yeah. Madam Chair, then I, I think the idea of the regular in investment in infrastructure report is really important. Mm -hmm. I think to put it into a context, it would also be helpful to have either as part of that report or separately regular report to this committee and the council about those reliability standards and where those reliability standards have been met, what the record of outage has been, outages have been, what parts of the city have been impacted by outages uh, on a regular basis so that the public has both sides right. of the coin to see the impact of failure to invest as well as the, the yes. investment. Yes. And also if you compare it to the SoCal Ed and San Diego and maybe PG&E just so they get a relationship that and I'm a little prejudiced how special we may be if those we statistics have, prove those out. Those statistics will be available. In 2005, that was the Toluca station in North Hollywood? It was the uh, station in North Hollywood, RSE, yeah. on, right. on, on Whitnell Highway. Whitnell Highway. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, no further questions or comments from uh, members? So then we will uh, take uh, heed of what has been requested here today. Certainly. Uh, and you'll help us draft that into a uh, motion, whether collectively or separately. It will be up to the proposer as to how they want to handle that. 
Um, and uh, this matter is being heard in council today. I yes, it's item number 31 as well, so the presentation will be provided there as well okay, to, the, to the full council. And we have forum issues today, so you might have to condense it a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay, so that will mark the end of that item, and then we will go into public comment for those items that are not on the agenda. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, please come forward. Bring Clyde with you. I don't know what it is. <laughs> nope. I'm a Tom. Come on. I'm all right, a Tom. All right. So are you going to be Tom from now on? For 15 no, years, I was Dr. Tom. I thought it was Dr. Clyde. Tom I mean, I got, I got into the Clyde. At any rate. I liked his Clyde. The, the other one. DWP, DPW. At least the acronyms are fairly close. Uh, DPW. We're facing a lot of rate increases there. Why? We don't know. We can't get reports. We can't get. What's the basis of all these projection, projected 5% increase in this, 5% increase in that for every year? for the next 20 years. Hopefully I won't be here. But anyway, uh, well, my son died at the age of 41 two weeks ago. But anyway, here's the basic issue. How can we get a plan as to what's going to happen in the year 2020? As far as how much does it really cost us to operate one of the nation's largest cities? with one of the nation's largest infrastructure system, the roads, everything. But let's focus on, we have a DWP, Office of Public Accountability uh, section, with a repair and a change in commission. Same way should be for DPW. Because I can't control the number of barrels that I have. So I have to pay no matter whether they're empty or full. Take your pay. And I can't do anything with the storm order. And it is coming. DPW went around the city council. They got somebody in the state legislature to authorize a new bill for the LA County so that LA County could increase the tax, the, sorry, the fee for storm water. It hasn't been changed for a long time. Yeah, it needed to be changed. However, it's a matter of how they do it. Now it's going to be, quotes, trickle down from L.A. County. How do we know what we're going to get versus what L.A. County is going to get? We don't know. A Office of Public Accountability should be applied to the Department of Public Works. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. The meeting is adjourned.